Okay, and it's time. Uh, so uh, I'm Tim Orling. I'm for, work for the Consulco Group, um, and today's talk is uh, Tales from the Crypt: uh, in Implementing Secure Boot and Disk Encryption on Tegra Platforms. So let me start off with uh, Straw Poll. Um, how many people are here because they've heard about Secure Boot and they need to know more? Okay. How many people are here because they heard about disk encryption and they need to know more? Okay. How many people are here just because of the Tegra platform in particular? Very hardware specific. Okay. Um, cool. Uh, so, Consulco Group, uh, we're a services company. We specialize in all kinds of embedded Linux stuff. We have a lot of very highly skilled staff that can solve a lot of problems for you. So. Uh, we do hardware, software, all kinds of things. We're actually based in San Jose, California, but we have engineering presence in Sweden, uh, Bulgaria, uh, Por uh, Portugal, Greece, United States, Canada, so all over the, the place. Uh, I always include my abstract just so that people who are writing new presentations can actually see what it was that got accepted. Um, and hopefully it's a Hopefully, I, I'm, I stay true to the abstract as to what I actually got done. Uh, so here's the agenda. So why is it Tales from the Crypt? Okay, this is a war stories talk, okay? Because I want people out there to realize that even folks that are, like, really have been around for a long time, doing this for, you know, 10, 20 years, like, our life is banging our head against a wall until it breaks, and then you run, and then you find another wall, and you bring it, bang your head against the wall, and, and it breaks. Okay. So the cool thing is, once you break that wall down, you get to the other side. You get to do the happy dance, right? And so that's a little bit about what I wanted to talk about today. Um, I will assure you that I'm actually giving you, you know, links to fully functional things that will really help you um, in, in the case of the secure boot and uh, disk encryption, and especially on the the Tegra platforms. So we're going to start off talking about secure boot, and then we'll go into disk encryption, and then I'll talk about future work. Uh, another thing about embedded space is nothing ever stands still. So secure boot. Um, NVIDIA has got a, a particular implementation. I think from a hardware standpoint and software standpoint, this is actually one of the better ones out there. I, I was really pleased when I did the assessment of, of how this stuff is working. Uh, so you've got keys or a hash of a key. So you've got a hash of your, uh, your private key or hash of the public key for your private key, for instance, will be in, burned into the fuses. Uh, burned into the fuses, that's an important thing to know. Um, and then there's also this uh, encrypted key storage uh, partition, and this has additional keys in it. So that one is unlocked by the ones that are in the fuses, right? So you've got a ROM that then looks for something that's secure, and then it opens up another layer of, of you know, security and another layer of security and another layer of security, right? So there's uh, this uh, trusted operating system. Um, at the time that this development was done, it was called Trusty. Uh, I'll get into where they're going with Opti in the future after that. Um, once you've gotten into uh, you're in NITRD, now you have client applications that can start to query those trusted applications for keys they are going to do things like unlock your disk partitions, right? So this is kind of about four layers in already in terms of uh, stuff that's secure and encrypted and, and trusted before you even got to unlocking the disk encryption. Um, so there's a couple of example applications um, for Trusty and also Opti. Uh, the hardware key agent and the LuxServe um, trusted applications. There's, there's client applications that talk to that. Um, in general, for secure boot specifically, there's multiple levels of, po of uh, possible security. The initial thing you have to have is the, the PKC, the public key um, cryptography. So this, you cannot flash the device without, you know, once it's been public, uh, public key encrypted or you know, set up for secure boot, you can't flash it without knowing what your public key is. So you have to do everything over secure communication once you've started down this path. 
The next level is secure boot key. So this is where you actually get secure boot, right? You don't, with just the public key encryption, you don't actually have any secure boot. All you've really done is kind of protected your ability to flash the device. On top of that, you can also do user key, and this is where you want to start to encrypt your kernel, or it's also used in the uh, disk, disk encryption. So there's kind of these three layers um, of progressive optional you know, security that you can do specifically for secure boot. The user key doesn't really come into play too much for secure boot. It, like I said, it is, it is useful if you want to encrypt your kernels or sign your kernels. Um, so secure boot is not one size fit all by any means, right? It is really, really specific to different platforms, how it works. So most of my experience was on Intel platforms, which is entirely different than what we're talking about here in terms of secure boot. Um, what I did in this work, uh, this was customer paid work. This was specifically targeting uh, the Jetson AGX Xavier platform or the, the T194 uh, class of of stuff. So this was specifically done with this you know, SDK that comes from NVIDIA, uh, Jetpack 4.6.1, or Linux 4 Tegra 32.7.1. Those two kind of mean the same thing. And this is Yocto based, so this was on the Yocto Dunfell uh, LTS release. So uh, you know, highly recommended that folks work on an LTS release, not, not some random release. Uh, will, will make your life a little bit better. Uh, by the end of the work, we I forwarded ported it to uh, Kirkston and a newer Jetpack. And before I you know, came to give this talk, uh, an even newer release came out, which is we'll talk about in future work. So about the fuses, um, I think this is kind of confusing at first uh, as to what the fuses are and what's, what's there, what do you use them for. So there's this ODM production mode fuse once you have burned that fuse, that one does not allow, you, you can no longer set any other fuses, right? So this is it. If you, if you set that fuse only, you can't do anything else, right? So um, in practice, I think for secure boot, you really absolutely are going to be focusing on the public key hash. So that's you know, your RSA uh, 2K bit or 3K bit on this platform. Uh, private key, you get the public key hash of that, and then, or the public key from that, and then they make a hash of that. That's uh, 256 bits that they flash into memory or into, into fuses. Um, and then there's the secure boot key, and this is, again, what actually allows for secure boot, right? So that, that's also needed. We've got these other keys. So there's the key encryption key zero and one. Um, those can be used by any of your client applications to talk to the trusted applications to get a key for whatever purpose you need a key for. This could be anything, right? You want a key to talk to some cloud provider service, right? And that, that could be what you use it for. Those are kind of like user, user keys. There's also this option on the, the AGX Xavier platform to do the KEK256. That's just a combination of the 228-bit keys into one key to give you more, more bits of security, right? And then there's the KEK2 key, uh, which is 128 bits. This one is what is used in the default Linux uh, Lux encryption, disk encryption, is the KEK2 key. So that one's kind of important later. Uh, in the slides, there's a link to where these all came from in the documentation. So big, big warning, okay? It's called a fuse for a reason, all right? It's a fuse. Once you turn it from a zero to a one, you're done, okay? So the boards ship with all the fuses at zero, except some stuff in the middle that NVIDIA has put in there that's, that's uh, device specific, right? Um, but NVIDIA recommends burning all the fuses at once at the beginning, so plan ahead, right? So in practice, I would say for development purposes, you're gonna want to have production key, or sorry, the public key, the secure boot key, and if you're trying to go secure, I would do KEK256, right, for your user key, but if you have maybe two different applications that wanna do something with 
a key, you might want to use both 0 and 1. And then the KEK2 is, again, going to be used for, for disk encryption later. Uh, keep your keys in escrow. So by that, I mean you know, make a tarball of it, put it somewhere, right? Keep it safe, even for, for development purposes, right? You still want to keep it safe somewhere, because once you've burned these keys, you have to have them in order to talk to your board anymore, right? So I read the documentation multiple times. I looked through all the steps. I thought I knew exactly what I was doing. I read some posts about things that had gone right or wrong, and I still thought I knew what I was doing. And I created a lovely brick. <laughs> okay. So my guess, it's just a guess, is I was on a, a slightly older release that may have had a problem with an RSA 3K key. So it may have created too big of a hash and overwritten one of those magic things that's in the middle that NVIDIA has flashed into the fuses. Or somehow, as an idiot, I burned the fuses twice. And so I burned them with one key and then, then burned a few more bits on top of that. But what, no matter what happened, what, you know, what ended up, and there's a link to the forum post that I did, where this board's just not going to come up anymore. It can never get out of ROM anymore. Just done, right? Not a happy day. Uh, but again, I wanted to tell you, you know, real stories, right? We brick boards. <laughs> you know, if you, if you haven't bricked a board in 10 years, you're not trying hard enough, right? Please work harder. <laughs> You're not working at all. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so where did I go from there? Well, it turned out I found this repo from one of the Metategra community folks called Secure Boot Tegra. They specifically wrote this because they were having trouble communicating with the NVIDIA tech folks on the forums to prove that something had gone wrong. Okay? So they wanted to make sure that, that everybody was following exactly the same steps. Well, I found that and I said, wow, this sounds fantastic. And so it turns out I modified it a little bit, but you can generate your keys. There's scripts that'll burn the fuses for you, right? It, it does the magic command line incantations to burn the fuses, right? Um, then you can actually flash an Ubuntu-based OS to your target that is now secure boot ready, right? So you can absolutely prove secure boot's working. You have no doubt whatsoever this is secure bidding, okay? Which is a nice, comfortable place to be before you start going into Yocto land and ripping everything apart and doing whatever you're going to do with it. Um, so paranoia. I originally started with the Debian 11 system. This version of the SDK says it supports Ubuntu 18.04, and that's it. They also say don't use a virtual machine, and so I ended up pulling out a nook they had in, you know, in the closet, putting a boot to 18.04 on it. And from then on, all flashing and fusing and everything that I ever did was only on that bare metal system. Okay? So that's what I will guarantee you works. <laughs> um, OK, so uh, links to the Consolco version of the Secure, secure Boot Tegra. Uh, guaranteed this stuff works. There's documentation in there on, on how to follow the steps. So uh, a little bit about Metategra. So uh, if you haven't heard of it, uh, this is a very uh, vibrant community that has set up uh, Yocto project layers to, uh, to let you build things for your Tegra platform. So it's really, really well maintained and tested. Like any other open source project, we've got you know, issues with um, resourcing. And so you can only do so much, right? So it's, it tends to be on the development end of things a little bit. So in order to do secure boot support, you can read more documentation um, specifically about how Met Metategra does it. But basically, it's as simple as take those keys that you generated from that secure boot Tegra repo I mentioned earlier, right? Take those keys, put them in your build directory, and add this to your, uh, your local.conf. So you're going to add the RSA private key, and you're going to add your S SBK uh, secure boot key uh, to that. And the resulting image that's built is installed just like any other thing would be that you built with Metategra. Because of the fact that you told it these keys, it built that into all the scripts that are going to run 
And so when you run do flash, it's just going to flash it for you. And so at that point, uh, you're doing it with sudo, and so uh, everything is just going to work. And, and if you've already flashed your fuses, you don't have to worry about things anymore as long as you have these things in there. So that was really it for, for secure boot, right? It was, oh my god, there's a lot of information in this documentation. And then, oh my god, I bricked the board. And then, oh, this magic incantation works, and it always works. So the next thing was the customer wanted disk encryption. So there's good things and bad things, in my opinion, about NVIDIA's implementation. So they did two really good things, right? They're using Lux, uh, the Linux unified key setup, and they're using DMcrypt. OK, so this is really well-supported stuff, or very commonly used stuff. Um, they've got a bunch of scripts, which are all um, very convoluted bash scripts. Uh, I don't think bash is the right tool for such convoluted things. Once you've started adding libraries and things like that, you should be using a real language like Python. But that's just my opinion. Um, so you also have to rip apart your rootfs to create an unencrypted boot partition such that uBoot or cboot can, can open that up, get the kernel running, and then unlock your rootfs that's encrypted. Not so happy here, right? So now you got this window where, uh, where you've, you're not secure, really. And, um, and you're also able, you know, you've got this, your kernel and everything in an unencrypted partition. Um, So the Lux passphrase, one of the things I do like about it is that the actual passphrase is derived from keys that are in your fuses and in your EKS uh, partition, that encrypted key storage partition. And it uses a unique device ID. So all of this together means that the actual disk encryption key that you're going to be using is pretty darn bulletproof, right? It's, it's got like multiple levels of security all, already built into it. So the decryption is actually done in the init RD. Um, they have a LuxServe app, which is the client application that talks to this LuxServe app that's a trusted application that's running in the trusted OS. And it unlocks the, the device mapper devices and switches over to the full root FS, just kind of like normal. <clears throat> so my first, uh, or my second war story, right? I went down a wonderful, wonderful path because I thought, Let's create a new image class. Let's do all the, the, DM, the Lux encryption in this image class. And so the resulting tarball and everything that I've got is just ready to flash and it's already encrypted, right? But pseudo tasks run in a not really pseudo root space, right? You don't actually have full privileges. It's kind of a fake pseudo, which is why they, we call it that. So we couldn't communicate to device mapper. No matter what I did, I tried a whole bunch of hacks. And we couldn't ever create the Lux header, so we couldn't actually format the container, and we couldn't start writing encrypted stuff into it. So I might be able to do this with QMU, possibly. But the other thing here is once you start having AB partitions, uh, now you have to know everything about your entire, you know, all your partitions and, and everything ahead of time. And it's kind of a bad assumption to know uh, what your A and B partitions are going to be, right? Because they're supposed to be interchangeable. So yes, the first time you burned this, it could have been OK. But how are you going to do upgrades and things like that? So here's a link to you know, that whole thing. Um, and you can look at a bunch of commits where I did some really crazy things. So then I had another good idea, all right? So I know I've gone down the wrong path. Let me try something else out. So I wanted to keep part of what I liked about the NVIDIA uh, implementation. One of the things they had was they have a different uh, passphrase for every partition. And I thought that was kind of cool, right? Um, rather than like most of our desktop systems when you're doing Lux encryption, you've just got one passphrase for the whole computer, right? 
Um, so I created another image class to create to rip apart the rootfs and create the unencrypted boot partition. And I did a hell of a lot of crazy stuff with var flags to store the UUID for each of the partitions. And then I used that to generate the kip crypt tab and generate the passphrases and a bunch of stuff like this, right? At one point, I even started using XML lint and XML starlet to actually parse and insert stuff into this flash XML file, which describes what all the partitions are actually going to be. But you probably already realize this is over-engineered, like a lot, like way over-engineered, which is what I tend to do anyway, but really over-engineered. It got really hairy trying to do all the uh, changes that needed to happen inside the Etsy Crypt tab. And I needed the Etsy Crypt tab before I created the init, init RD, right? The init RMFS. So it turned out to be this like nested, you know, dollar squiggly bracket variable expansion hell. I mean, I spent hours trying to figure out how to properly, you know, escape the characters and everything to get it to, to work. And ultimately, I still never even got to like Lex encryption. I'm doing all this stuff to set up all the partitions and set up crypt tab and all this other stuff, and I never actually got there. So I've got two links there for, for where this crazy stuff went. By this point, you can imagine I've been working on this for a while. I'd already bricked a board. I've gone down two kind of dead ends, and I'm getting frustrated, right? So I did find a solution, and it wasn't, I didn't author it, I, I augmented it, but what if we don't root, rip apart the rootfs? Okay. What if we don't require the unencrypted boot partition? Can we do that? Because that sounds better to me. What if we perform the disk encryption on the device rather than ahead of time on the host, right? So if you're doing it ahead of time on the host, that means your factory floor has to have the keys, and then they have to create the new rootfs for every single device, and then flash it. That is not production ready, right? This is one of the biggest failings, in my opinion, of what you know, NVIDIA was putting out as their implementation. The other cool thing is that this approach allowed us to sign for secure boot independently of the disk encryption. Completely 100% divorced. You can have either one or both together. So bonus, I think it's way more production friendly because you can actually sign, send your images off to a secure enclave that has you know, your keys stored in a HSM and actually do the signing there. And um, the Im images can then be installed on the factory floor without needing to know a whole bunch of information. And special bonus, OTA updates just work because there's nothing special about your OTA bundle and it's already gonna be installed onto, a, onto an encrypted system. So uh, I use uh, Tegra test distro. This is, there's another distro called Tegra demo distro. Um, they're part of the Meta, uh, Meta Tegra community. So this was created by Matt Madison, who's actually the, the, you know, the godfather of Meta Tegra. And it, what it has is a two-stage approach. It starts off by booting into a system installer. So it's got a special init RAMFS that knows about your flash partition table. And it writes those things out, creates all those partitions, creates the Lex headers. It takes your real root FS and writes it on device into the encrypted partitions now. And bonus, it installs a bootloader update. And so when this system reboots, all signs of the installer operating system are gone, right? So now you're just in your purely secure booting system with everything disk encrypted. So how long does this disk encryption take on disk? Like a minute. Who cares, right? It's nothing. So it's really cool. So I really love the fact that it decrypted, or, or sorry, decoupled secure boot from Lux, because um, everything's happening on, the, on the, the device. 
So what do you do to enable that? So basically, we're abusing a machine override by telling it to be crypt parts, right? So we're telling your machine you have this crypt parts capability. And that just stands for crypt cryptographically signed partitions, right? We do need to have the tarball that we're going to actually install. And so not just the normal Tegra flash, uh, which is the normal image class that you use to, to have the flash scripts and everything to flash to your device, but we need the tarball because that system installer is actually going to have the tarball present and then it's going to install it. Um, all your in partitions that are actually going to be encrypted, all you have to do is put a crypt dash in front of it. And the scripts are actually going to look at that and see this needs to be encrypted, add it to the, crypt, the SC crypt file and things like this. And it basically just kind of magically takes care of everything for you. The one cool thing that I didn't know about at this time, you know, looking at these crazy flash XML scripts was you could use ID equals number and actually specify which partition number to use. This is kind of important because on a stock system, it's got 46 partitions. Anybody want to guess what any one of them does? I mean, some of them have some names that make some sense, some of them don't, so it was kind of confusing. So once you've set these, these things up, you just uh, do BitBake Tegra sys install. So this creates the special sys installer image that has that special init RAMFS that does all this auto install for you. Uh, so this is not all fully upstreamed yet, but um, I've got uh, functional branches for Kirkston release and the Jetpack 4.6.2 or um, Linux for Tegra 32.7.2. And it's, um, we've got some discussion happening on the actual Tegra test distro uh, for a pull request. Uh, a little bit about, a um, little more details here about the EKS image and things like that. So you don't need to create your own EKS image with the, the keys and everything like that until you get to Lux disk encryption. You just don't. You can do secure boot all day long with the stock EKS image. You don't have to worry about it. The moment you set, the moment that you fuse and burn KEK2 that you're going to be using for the Lux disk encryption, you must create your own EKS image. You have to. There is no option. So the other thing is that the stock EKS image is all zeros, so the user key that's in there is also all zeros. So even if you were to use the stock EKS image, you still have to pass the user key, uh, an all zeros user key in to, uh, to do the disk encryption later on. Uh, following what had been so successful with the secure boot, I just added on to the secure boot Tegra repo and created another, uh, another branch that went into, that adds some more scripts and some more test scripts and things like that to actually like make sure all this Lux uh, encryption is working. And again, I used NVIDIA's operating system. So not only do you know for a fact you're doing secure boot, but you also know for a fact that you're doing Lux disk encryption. So you're, you know that before you even started on Yocto, everything is, is as secure and everything as you wanted it to be. So my favorite part of this whole project was when I came to the OTA updates because it just worked. I did nothing special. So we were using Rauk in this case. Um, also works really well with Mender. So because of the fact that the disk encryption is performed on the device, once your device is up and running and communicates to get your OTA bundle, you don't have to do anything special, right? Your device was already secure booted. There's nothing magic, right? You don't need, you just use your normal rock signed bundle mechanism or, or signed mender mechanism, right? So you already have the ability to talk to that server, get that, get that bundle, install it, switch over, and you're done. Um, I can't tell you how happy I was that that was just done. It just worked. Like, it never, I never had any problems with it whatsoever. It's just normal procedures for OTA updates. So, um, 
future work. So I think it was like two weeks ago, there's a new Jetpack 5.0.2, which is the new general audience release. And I was really excited about this because they switched to Opti. So more of an industry standard, ARM standard, trusted operating system. Uh, they switched to UEFI instead of their C boot bootloader, or we had actually hacked things to work with, with U boot, but it's just nice to have them standardize on something, right? And I think with uh, system ready, ARM systems are going to UEFI being required. And also, no more 4.9 kernel, it's 5.10, right? It's not 5.19, it's not 5.15, but I'll take 5.10 over 4.9 any day of the week, right? Please. Um, the cool thing is they also ported the LuxServe uh, trusted application, the LuxServe app client application, and the hardware key agent and hardware key app. Uh, and so those are there. They're ready to, for us to you know, do some more testing and everything in the Tegra community, but, um, but it's promising that I might actually be able to get all of this to work on the new system pretty simply. You know, famous last words. Um, so they, they moved from CBoot to UEFI 4.9 kernel to 5.10 kernel, and you can at least use it in Ubuntu 20.04 host. Not, you're not stuck on 18.04, because every time you run 18.04, it says, hey, there's no more updates. Are you sure you want to run this kind of you know, stuff? Um, the only caveat is it only works on these um, AGX Xavier, Xavier NX, and the new AGX Orin um, platforms. So the old TX1, TX2, and so on, those, those aren't supported anymore. I think NVIDIA just wants you to move only to the new hardware. Uh, so the other thing that I'm working on right now is actually taking the components that I have in that, that feature branch that totally worked for, te for the test distro and getting some stuff into um, the demo distro, which is the more community supported thing that goes through CI and that all the time. Uh, so there's this special, the, the, thing, the thing that does all the magic in that auto installer is uh, Tegra sysinstall. So that's going to have to be added. Um, I need to add in, you know, into these into Tegra demo distro. We need to add in the crypt uh, init ramfs. Need to make sure we got CI and tests. Actually, like making sure this stuff's working, you know, as much as possible. And in the short term, you know, just because I already have it all working, right? And I know it works. I'm going to be pushing up the existing work that was fully functional. Get that out there. And then we're in the middle of. Uh, working with Langsdale, the new Yocto release, 4.1 release, and the Jetpack 5.0.2 stuff. Um, mostly the Jetpack 5 is working. Uh, Metategra community, we're all working on this stuff, um, testing it out. There's a couple of hiccups here and there, but you know, it looks pretty good so far. There's a couple of things that don't quite seem like they should have been claimed to be production, uh, but it's not too bad. Uh, but in particular, I haven't tested any of this stuff out because as a contractor, I move from project to project. So, you know, I'm not, we're not working on this specific thing right at this moment. But, uh, but all this stuff will be upstreamed. So um, I really want to thank Matt Madison for all that he does for the Open Embedded for Tegra community and specifically the stuff that I got to piggyback on top of from Tegra Test Distro and so on. And uh, Ilyas Chigui, he, he did a lot of uh, early testing on stuff that I was trying to get out there for the community and uh, found some typos and things like that. So it was really helpful to have that. And I really want to thank the OE4 uh, Tegra community for um, just being really excited that I was working on this and, and really being excited to you know, answer questions or test stuff out and everything. It was just really awesome. You know, I think we're all here because this is open source and we're all into community. And it's just awesome when that's reinforced by a community you've never worked with before. And they just accept you and, and, and work with you on it. And that was just awesome. So uh, I think we've got some time for questions. About six minutes. Yes. So the init ramifest could have been signed, but the uh, 
the way that NVIDIA was booting it, it was actually booting from the bootloader into the unencrypted boot partition, and then from then on it was encrypted, right? So the reason they had to do it that way was the way that they were doing the, so they were doing the um, encryption first and then signing everything and then, then flashing it. So because of the fact that we're doing those two, two things completely separate and doing the encryption on target, that meant that the signing is completely 100% independent. So all the secure boot and all of that kind of stuff that was, you know, was needed in order to be able to even unlock the init RemFS, all that stuff's just already there. Um, and so basically, you know, C boot just hands straight off to you uh, an init RemFS, which is already got the ability to unlock the, the uh, partitions because it can talk to the trusted um, applications. But don't you need to clarify the inner parameters? Otherwise, you could just put your own in and read out the keys. But it's signed. OK, so it's signed. Yes, okay. yes. So that partition is signed. So that partition could never have been loaded it would barf at you because it wasn't wasn't signed. Yeah. So uh, I will say that I did all uh, I did a lot of the work without ever doing any secure boot. I just did pure Lux disk encryption. So in that case, yes, I was vulnerable to the attack you're talking about. But ultimately, once you were doing the full secure boot and everything, um, the init RMFS and everything was signed. Thank you. So. Um, when the partitions are being encrypted in InterMFS, yep. uh, what kind of beta system was InterMFS using? Like InterMFS uh, framework, a module, or? Yeah, so the question was, what is the init, what is the init system being used in, in the init RAMFS? So this is one of the other things I really liked about Matt's uh, implementation, because it's all, it's all system D. So I know that people have, they groan about system D because it's a little bit heavy on embedded systems. I understand that, right? But everybody's moving to system D these days and system D really feels nice to me. Like it's just, I understand it really well and I'm not hacking at shell scripts all the time. So I've done some really, really hairy work on init RD systems that were sysv init and it, it was just so much extra work to make the make sure the shell scripts worked, it, it, I I just don't think it's worth it anymore. So I, I, system D made so you you benefit from a bunch of stuff about crypt tab and fs tab and all this other stuff you know and the the dmcrypt uh, stuff that's already built into system D. All of that stuff came along for the ride for free, and it made this really much easier to to work with. Yes. Yes. So the question is, uh, is this implementation able to flash directly to an NVMe? Uh, so yes, so I did not have an NVMe on the particular board that I was using, so I didn't test that path out. But we're, yeah, so it, it's, it, it really doesn't matter what the storage media is. So SD card or EMMC or N NVMe would work as long as, because um, basically the most of the magic is, is the stuff that's flashed into. Um, so you, obviously you have to have the fuses set up and also you have to um, have your system set up that it's going to boot to whatever the, de the device is that you want to boot it to but it should not affect the ability to flash. So the flashing scripts from MetaTegra should have flashed the same auto installer uh, operating system onto your NVMe. And then once that booted up, it knew because of uh, 
there's there's a service that's similar to what system D has, but it knows about the boot devices that are going to be coming up, and then it uses that to uh, to do the actual uh, final crypt tab and and the the disk encryption. So there's a lot of details here I had to gloss over because it's only so much time in the talk, but I'm I'm quite confident that that would be no problem. A couple more questions. Uh, a question about sudo. So you said that you don't have provided the functionality. Did you consider implementing it or was it against the Yopto philosophy of doing like that? Can you repeat one more time? Yeah, so basically sudo was not doing what you needed. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it all comes down to what capabilities sudo is allowed to have, right? And and so I couldn't run LO setup, right? So that's what I, I had to do LO setup what and and. So uh, yeah, um, I'll just say I spent enough time hacking at it that I thought I was burning customer dollars, and so I just moved on. Um, I'm pretty sure there are other ways around it. I'm not sure sudo is going to be the best hack. I think it'd probably be better off running QMU, QMU uh, as part of the build system. Um, NVIDIA did everything in its root, but you know, it just started to get pretty ugly. I, I did some pretty pretty heavy, heavy hacks to try to get things to work and it just wasn't getting anywhere short of actually patching sudo. So, you know, it's it's possible. I am not I'm not sure to be honest with you. We have at least two others. Uh, I'll go to the back. Oh, sorry. Time is up. So, uh, I will be at the Yocta Project booth the next couple of days and you can see me in the hallway and I love talking to people, so just, you know, or find me on Twitter or whatever. I'm, I'm really happy to talk to people. Um, and that's it. Thank you so much.